Hi, good morning. Um, I am Dr. Akriti Gupta. I am an interventional cardiologist, assistant professor of cardiology at Smith Heart Institute at Cedar Sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. <clears throat> I have um, esteemed Professor Nicholas Van Megum. Uh, he's professor of interventional Card cardiology at the Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam. And we are here to talk about the TAVR unload trial. We're very excited because the community has been waiting for this trial for years, uh, and we'll get into that. Um, and uh, this is slated for late breaker uh, presentation at the TCT in Washington, D.C. in um, October of this year, so coming up very soon. And we are very uh, proud to present this in Jack as a simultaneous publication. So uh, Dr. Nicholas Van Meekem, without further ado, it would be great if you can Give us your, um, in brief, the main findings of this trial. Thank you very much, Akriti, for the nice introduction. And also thank you to Jack for uh, having uh, this paper uh, published simultaneously with the presentation. So um, it has been a long time in the making indeed. The premise for the randomized controlled study. We were looking at patients who were symptomatic with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction and moderate aortic valve stenosis. We identified eventually 89 patients that to be randomized for the TF TAVR arm and 89 patients to be randomized to the clinical aortic stenosis surveillance arm with aortic valve replacement only upon progression to severe aortic stenosis. So basically this is a heart failure study with patients who have HFREF and moderate aortic stenosis. Our primary endpoint was the hierarchical uh, occurrence of a composite of all-cause death, disabling stroke, hospitalizations for heart failure or heart failure hospitalization equivalents, or a change in KCCQ. We initially started with a trial uh, aiming for 600 patients, mm -hmm. randomizing 300 to each treatment arm. We eventually uh, ended up with 79 in each um, uh, treatment arm, or uh, sorry, 89 in each treatment arm. Um, and the reason for that was that uh, we faced relatively slow enrollment and eventually we were forced to uh, stop enrollment uh, at the end of 2022. If we look at the harder clinical endpoints, so mortality, all-cause death or MACE, no difference between the two treatment arms. There was also no difference in hospitalizations for heart failure between the two treatment arms. And I was surprised to see that because I had anticipated at least um, a difference in um, hospitalizations, heart failure hospitalizations, although numerically there were more hospitalizations in the uh, clinical surveillance arm, this did not reach the statistical significance. An important analysis uh, was the quality of life assessment by the KCCQ. And there, uh, at longest follow-up, there was no difference uh, between the two treatment strategies. But at one year, the TAVR arm had significantly, did it did uh, significantly better than the clinical surveillance arm. So there was an increase in KCCQ of uh, a median of 12 versus 3 in the control arm. If we then did an, an exploratory analysis only looking at the follow at uh, patients with TAVR in the TAVR arm versus the patients in the clinical surveillance arm who did not receive a TAVR. So that's very interesting because then you did, do not have the effect of the mm -hmm. TAVR procedure. Then you, you could notice clearly that there was no difference in KCCQ in the clinical surveillance arm. So there was no change. Whereas you could see a clear, a clinically uh, important improvement in KCCQ in the TAVR arm. And I think this um, is an important finding, but at the same time, it also um, relates to the limitations of the study. Eh? So we have to acknowledge that the primary endpoint uh, was not different between the two treatment strategies. We also acknowledge that there was a slow enrollment that forced us to change uh, the, the statistical plan. Uh, but at one year, it is undeniable that um, the quality of life of the patients uh, improves significantly when you treat moderate aortic stenosis preemptively in patients with HFREF. 
And I think uh, there are other trials that are still underway uh, dealing with patients with moderate aortic stenosis. As you know, there is the PROGRESS trial, there is the tavrex 2 trial, and those uh, trials are not only looking at patients with HFREF, but they are looking at patients with, uh, regardless of ejection fraction, but who have some kind of signal of cardiac damage. I think those are very uh, interesting trials uh, that will uh, shed further light on patients with moderate aortic stenosis. Thank you so much, <clears throat> Dr. Van Meegum. That was a very nice uh, comprehensive summary of the trial. Um, to summarize, uh, this, is a pa uh, this is a study in patients with moderate AS with low EF, randomized to TAVR versus guideline-directed medical therapy. And we find that in the longest follow-up at a median of 23 months, the primary endpoint, which is a composite of mortality, stroke, um, and quality of life endpoints, was not significantly different. Um, mm -hmm. And if you just looked at quality of life, it was actually better in the patients who uh, were in the TAVR arm at one year. And if you compared the um, patients who did, in fact, received TAVR versus not because there was a significant crossover, then there's a significant difference. So I think the very important point in this trial is that about one in two patients in the control arm ended up crossing over and receiving a TAVR. And majority of these were because they had, in fact, progressed to severe AS and, in fact, received guideline-directed therapy of TAVR. So could one argue that if you just do watchful, good clinical surveillance of patients with <coughs> moderate AS with low EF, then they will declare themselves, and then we go ahead and perform guideline-directed TAVR? Or would you want to advocate still for performing TAVR in these patients based on the results of your study? I think that is the, the key question here. How do we need to take the information from the TAVR unload to our clinical practice? Um, well, first, I would like to start by saying that I don't see those patients as crossovers, right? They did not cross over. Well, they had a guide. All of a sudden, they evolved to a guideline indicated situation where they had to re be treated for their severe aortic stenosis. So if they would have been treated for moderate aortic stenosis, I would agree this is a crossover. Now, this is basically a time that is catching up with them. And mm -hmm. the, the thing, the interesting finding that we had was we did not expect that the aortic stenosis would progress at this speed. It was very fast. And this obviously suggests that some of those patients were already on the verge of mm -hmm. from moderate to severe aortic stenosis. Um, but I don't think that um, uh, this is a trivial thing to do. I, I do believe that we have to still perform the butamine stress echoes, that we still have to look at the gestalt of the patients to make sure that the patient would benefit from uh, a TAVR treatment or aortic valve replacement in general. Um, what, I, what my takeaway would be is that if a patient is heavily symptomatic uh, with moderate aortic stenosis and has um, a HFREF, well, it, is, um, it makes a lot of sense to start a discussion with the patient and to mm -hmm. analyze whether a transfemoral TAVR would be, uh, would be feasible and would be safe. Well, I think in the trial, it's clear that in selected patients, it is very safe. Mm -hmm. is a very safe uh, option. And um, well, the, the clinically meaningful improvements in uh, quality of life as assessed by the KCCQ, I don't think it's trivial. I mean, this was an increase of more than 10 points. This is quite significant. And um, we did not see that in the patients who did not progress to severe aortic stenosis in the control arm. They really had worse KCCQ numbers than mm -hmm. the TAVR arm. So yeah, I think um, I think one of the key things here is to congratulate the investigator team for persevering through a very hard time, which was hard for the entire world, uh, but obviously very difficult to conduct trials during COVID-19. And um, obviously the original trial was powered for the primary endpoint at one year with 600 patients. And like you mentioned, we ended up with a study of around 178 patients 
um, which obviously is underpowered, and then the oh. design change to the for the primary endpoint for the longest follow up. So it's going to be very hard to conduct the same trial again in patients with moderate AS and low EF. And the trials that are coming up now are for moderate AS with preserved EF. So in the absence of another trial for this study, um, we have to take whatever we can learn from the study and apply to our patients. And even though your study did not show exactly this, but my question is, do you agree with the inference that the evidence from the study is enough to um, is would suffice us having an individualized approach to patients with moderate AS and low EF um, in such a setting where we can offer TAVR if they're getting rehospitalized again and again for heart failure exacerbations, for example. So I think we'll have to pick and choose uh, these patients and have individualized discussions is what I'm you know, learning from this trial. Would you agree? I definitely agree with that summary. Um, and we have to also manage expectations, right? Um, by doing a preemptive TAVR, based on the TAVR unload, we will not affect survival. Mm -hmm. And we will not um, reduce heart failure hospitalizations, but we will improve the quality of life. And from a patient perspective, that obviously can be very significant. Absolutely. I think we as clinicians, we have to make sure that we avoid futility. And mm -hmm. that is uh, and that's an important one because uh, the mortality um, rate is quite high in these patient populations. We know that patients with advanced heart failure have mortality rates that go uh, north of 50% at five years. So that means that you also have to put that in perspective. You really have to identify the patients where you can expect at least um, a change in their quality of life. And I think we have some tools to do that, um, but it's definitely, I don't think that TAVR unload can justify uh, uh, let's do TAVR for all patients with moderate aortic mm -hmm. stenosis in the context of HFREF. No, I think we we really have to make this a patient-based, uh, individualized decision-making progress uh, process. And I think one important thing to point out is that all of these patients who did receive TAVR was with balloon expandable valves. Yeah. Um, and and a, a hypothetical question here is, if they were to receive self-expanding valves, which are known to have a higher pacemaker rate or more paravalvular leak, for example, would that have resulted in similar degree of safety? Because right now yeah. we're saying it is safe, it may not impact survival, uh, but it may improve quality of life. I'm not yeah. sure if that assertion would remain true if we used uh, self-expanding valves, because obviously self-expanding valves have better hemodynamics, but we're not talking about young patients who have 10 years ahead of them. We're talking about very sick patients who have a few years ahead of them, and hemodynamics may or may not play an important role. But if they were to become pacemaker dependent or have a paravagular leak, that could actually impact the safety of this procedure. What are your thoughts about that? I think this is very intriguing, right? Uh, but I also uh, would caution with um, overanalyzing and, mm -hmm. and making speculations on what if we would have used a self-expanding valve. I think 10 years ago, there was no way that we would design this trial with a self-expanding valve. Because I agree with you there, the, the pacemaker rates were 20%. Mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. the, the incidence of more than mild paravalvular leak was significantly higher as compared uh, with balloon expandable valves. But I think the situation there also has matured. Um, I think we, we do see pacemaker uh, rates that seem to be in the single digit numbers uh, with, self, with some of the self-expanding systems. Um, the paravalvular leaks with the ceiling fabrics um, is becoming more and more exotic. Um, but at the same time, I would I would caution comparing mm -hmm. uh, balloon expandable with self-expanding valves in in this in this uh, context for now. At the same time, um, I think the stakes are very high with patients with um, with HFREF. and so you want to reduce all uh, the safety issues to. Um, to a, to a maximum, right? You don't want to have pacemakers. You don't want to have PVL Absolutely. because these patients are already in dire straits. So you need to help them. Um, and that 
where that is where I feel that patient selection and maybe also device selection um, becomes very important. I don't think there is one device that fits all. Wonderful. Uh, this was a very uh, intellectually uh, intriguing chat for me, and I learned so much uh, just talking to you despite having actually handled this manuscript. Uh, and once again, congratulations for a very successful uh, conduct of the trial through completion and look forward to your TCT presentation. Thank you very much, Akriti. Thank you for a very nice discussion, and I really look forward to, to meeting you in Washington next week. Absolutely. Thank you.